Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz. This will serve as your lecture for Tuesday's class. So go at your own pace and uh, make sure that you go through the material in the book and maybe use this as a compliment. The first chapter that I'll talk about today is the one on pricing. Chapter 12 is more on global marketing channels and physical distribution. So we're talking logistics in that case. But this chapter deals with pricing. And as you all probably can guess that when you're talking about pricing of products, that has a direct correlation or a direct relationship uh, with the ability to make certain profits. As you may also know, you've taken enough accounting courses to know that running a successful business is about controlling costs. Now, we all know the four P's. We know about the product itself. What goes into the product matters because then we're talking about costs. We're talking about components. We're talking about inputs. We're talking about procurement. And so you have to have good supplier relationships in order to ensure that you have the quality, but that you're also getting a good price so that your per unit cost of your product is not so high. You also have the, the idea of promotion, which, of course, is another one of those P's. Now, your promotion depends on a lot of things. It depends on perhaps the type of product that you're positioning. It uh, depends on the location. It depends on the demographic. It depends on the environment, the competitive environment that you're in. Uh, it depends on a number of different factors. And you have different promotional strategies. And when we talk about promotional strategies, we're talking about more than just uh, advertising. We're talking about a whole uh, chain of events that occur. But let's say we're talking about advertising and you're trying to figure out what type of advertising I'm going to do for my product, whether it be billboards, whether it be radio, whether it be print media, TV, digital marketing, is it going to be mobile in terms of having taxi cabs and buses involved in your ad campaigns? What is it going to be? What is the combination in terms of your promotion? And of course, you have a price point for each of those methods. So again, you're dealing with cost because, of course, how much you spend to promote the product is going to be absorbed in to the, to the entire apparatus. You also have distribution, which is the next chapter. But I will say about distribution that, of course, you can see where the cost would make a big difference. Also, depending on where this target location is. Because it will depend on uh, or it will determine which factor uh, is most important. Is it time? Of course, time is of essence when you have perishable items, things that have to get the market immediately, probably would uh, take air freight in order to get them there in a timely fashion. If you're thinking of costs, and let's say your market is in Brazil, maybe you use a sea seagoing vessel to get your goods. It takes a little bit longer, but it may be cheaper. It may be more uh, cost uh, effective in terms of what it is you can do. So in terms of distribution, you have to have those ideas in mind in terms of what it takes to get from point A to point B. Do you need truck cargo? Do you need air cargo? Do you need other types of um, mechanisms in order to make that supply chain fluid and to reduce the friction? Then you get the pricing. How do you price your products? Now you have to look at all the other things. You have to look your, at your production cost. Mm -hmm. You have to look at your fixed cost, uh, all the other costs incurred to make this product. 
And that will often determine how you price your products because you have a target, probably a target profit that you're looking at. You want to make a certain margin on this product, which means that you have to make the price uh, one in which you're able to make that margin. If you pay more in terms of your per unit cost, then your margins are going to be thinner unless you raise the price. So you have these issues. You have issues in terms of market dynamics, competition coming in and adjusting prices as the market grows and evolves. So those are some of the things that we always have to think about. We have to think about cost all the time. And there is a relationship between what you price for, what type of prices you have for your products, and obviously the cost that it it um, the the cost incurred in to make those products. When you go international, and I'm looking at my notes here, when you go international, there are a number of, of additional costs that may be incurred. We talked in previous chapters about exporting. We've talked about licensing. We've talked about investing. Uh, in foreign markets in terms of if you want to buy a plant or if you want to, let's say, buy a company or buy a, a share in a company so that you can get your products through that supply chain. These are all ways in which you would um, consider you know, your, your, your strategies. Uh, but of course, the um, pricing of your product is, uh, again, going to be folded into that, um, that whole strategy of pricing. So I want to share with the class this article that I found, uh, and I also share it with my global business class. This deals with pricing or has some pricing tips, 11 biz biggest challenges of international business in 2017 and it has all of these different uh, points including company structure and laws and regulations and accounting but I want to take you down to where it talks about pricing use predictive pricing anything your company owns that has monetary value in order of liquidity it's telling you to look ahead, use customer segmentation, monitor other businesses, which is called corporate uh, corporate espionage. And it says avoid discounting your prices, especially for services, unless it is an industry standard based on volume. Once you offer a discount, it is nearly impossible to later change your regular price and still keep your customer. There are a lot of the exceptions on that. Find the right price. These are some tactics. Some of them you may have remembered from principles of marketing. Keep it simple. This is a very interesting point here. And you look at the pricing uh, of this product, which is $15.99. You have some with the symbols, the dollar signs, the commas, the decimal places, and the zeros added. And it is basically saying the more symbols you have, the more expensive the product seems. So it goes from this price tag here to this one that's just $15.99. Looks less daunting. In with a nine, you may know about odd even pricing from principles of marketing. That's called psychological. That's psychological pricing. And that is the odd even price where you may end with a 9 or a 99 or a 95 uh, because as we all know 49.99 is the same as $50 but we tend to look at the first digit as opposed to the other digits we we look more 40 than we do 50 and then it talks about using uh, price anchoring to place expensive products around less expensive products so the less expensive product can get more attention which is a very interesting tactic to use and then offer tiered pricing offer three options often a bargain price a price you actually want people to pay and also a luxury price 
So I thought these were very interesting uh, points when you talk about pricing. So let's look at some ideas that they have for us in chapter 11. We start off by talking about law of one price. I, to be honest, I don't like the way they explain it here, but the way they explain it is that all customers in the market get the best product for the best price. When I was in graduate school taking marketing management, there was a, a definition of marketing that really stuck with me. And I'm paraphrasing, but the, the definition of marketing was getting the right things to the right place at the right price at the right time with the right amount of promotion. So it was all these things that you had to do right in order to be a successful marketer. So when you talk about law of one price, you're talking essentially a strategy in which you'll have one price for all of your markets. So you're talking about a dollar for a widget that you have produced, you position that into another market, that product is the equivalent of one dollar in that market. So with the exchange rate, then you, of course, make it in a denominations of that currency. So that whole idea of law of one price is a, a very easy way to go about your pricing uh, strategy. So they also talk about these markets and here they have diamonds, crude oil, both of which are commodities. Then they have the, the durable good, the finished goods, commercial aircraft, and integrated circuits or IC chips. And of course, the latter two require a lot of intense capital in terms of components and parts and uh, standards and all type of regulations. The first two, diamonds and oil, those are mined. So you actually have to dig in the, for the diamonds, you dig in the tunnels, and for oil, you dig in rock. And basically, you find deposits of petroleum that you suck out. And, you know, you apply steam to it, you liquefy it, and you turn it into a lot of different uh, derivatives uh, from petroleum. And so all of these are very highly capitalized uh, and also highly regulated. So even the pricing is going to be highly regulated for these four markets. You look at diamonds. Diamonds are a scarce commodity and they are scarce so that the price remains stable. You don't want somebody dumping, say, counterfeit or illegal diamonds into the market because then that will create a glut and the price will um, there will be pressure to lower the prices. Crude oil is also the same way, highly regulated by a lot of the oil producing nations, including OPEC, which is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, which uh, primarily it consists of a lot of Middle Eastern countries, but also includes countries like uh, Venezuela, Nigeria. They're all part of this oil cartel, which keeps the price of oil stable to avoid price shocks. And of course, we have other countries that uh, produce a lot of oil, such as uh, Russia is a major oil producing nation, which is not part of OPEC. The United States is also an oil producing nation, uh, but they are not part of the, uh, the grouping. Then you look at national markets. Now you're getting into consumer goods and products. There are thousands of consumer goods and many of these products and the pricing of these products are determined by supply and demand. And these markets are allowed to self-correct. They're allowed to uh, find the equilibrium. You all remember in economics, you have the equilibrium price. So you have an aggregate market. You have all of these competitors with their products in this aggregate market. And there is an equilibrium. So the equilibrium price for a product is the point at which a customer or a buyer is willing to pay the price that a company is willing to sell it at. That's kind of the equilibrium point. Now, if you start moving off the equilibrium, 
now you could have either shortages or surpluses because if your price is too high maybe your consumer isn't willing to pay that price if it's too low then the company runs the risk of not only running out of inventory but then the margins being very thin and not being able to make um, a profit so in the national market you have self uh, correcting uh, well if you're in in the type of system that we have the whole supply and demand is supposed to be self correcting and you do have some regulation but the government is to just ensure that everyone is playing fair and not engaging in price gouging and predatory you know, predatory pricing and creating uh, monopolies and we all know about the antitrust laws in America that um, those are prohibited because what happens if you're a monopoly and you're the only one selling this product then it becomes an inelastic product because you can charge any amount of uh, money for that product and people would be willing to pay it because you're the only game in town so to speak so in these markets you have a, a lot of flexibility in terms of how markets are managed um, the government typically has a hands-off policy and allows companies to come in very easily and make their case as a successful company and also allow them to to leave and of course there are provisions for bankruptcy and and just gracefully exiting the market there's no shame in that in terms of global pricing concepts now you have some different factors you have a min max type of situation minimum price maximum price what is the band of pricing that you're going to establish in this market one of the things that you you may do is you have to look at what your competition is doing especially in a foreign market and it's also going to depend on the government policy in terms of how foreign companies are treated because you have all of these things that you have to uh, that you have to get as a foreign company you've got to get all kinds of licenses and maybe pay specific taxes so here they give you some basic uh, concepts you have to develop a system of policies that address the min max the optimum prices which is a function of global demand or uh, supply and demand the same in domestic uh, economy must be consistent with global opportunities and constraints be aware of price transparency created by the eurozone the internet and that is true in a lot of different markets and uh, the other thing is that when you're in a foreign government they may have certain policies in terms of finance in terms of uh, not only uh, different currency rates but the the uh, idea of taking your money that you've earned in that country out of the bank and sending it back home sending it back to the the headquarters sometimes governments will have a restriction on how much a foreign company can take out of the bank at any one time because think about it if, if you had a situation where companies were taking millions or perhaps billions out of their bank to send back home that will create a shock in the in the banking system or at least in that bank and um, probably uh, within that whole uh, society um, because of course that capital is used for investments is used for loans is used um, also to um, when we talk uh, talk about the the way the banking system works uh, the banking system use uses deposits in the bank to lend out so these banks do not have all the depositors money on hand at any one time because they take your deposits they give you if it's a savings account they give you five six percent interest they take your money and they lend it out to someone and they charge a higher interest uh, rate
or or maybe they put it on the market as an investment. They take your deposits and your, they invest it, and then that results in revenue for um, for the bank. So if you take your money out, then that really disturbs the the flow of capital in the system, and some governments will step in and not allow that. So here we have the nuts and bolts. Managers must determine the objectives for the pricing objectives. It's kind of redundant, right? Managers must determine the objectives for the pricing objectives. So let's just say that the manager, or let's say you're an entrepreneur, and you're trying to figure out what it is that you're doing in your business. One of the first things that you're doing is very simple. And what is that? Trying to make money. Okay, why, why else would you be in business? You're trying to make money. Uh, you're trying to turn a revenue stream. And you're trying to reinvest that money somewhere else. And maybe if, you're, if you do well enough, you'll be able to give some of that, reinvest some of that money, not only in your own business, but also in society as part of your corporate social responsibility. But a manager has to, to, to think very uh, small and, and, and look at the minutia of his or her business. So you're talking about unit sales and how much are you charging per unit? And of course, that get into that gets into um, price per unit. That gets into variable costs, fixed costs, and gets into all of this. And so, of course, you have forecast. You're looking at how many units you're going to sell at the end of the period, whether it be you're talking about the month, or the quarter, or the year. You're looking at what are my unit sales going to be? How much margin am I going to make per unit? So you're looking at that and you're controlling the cost along the way. Then you're looking at market share. How much of the market can I control? So I remember talking to you about the Japanese strategy for market entry. And I believe that was the last video I did. What I didn't tell you or what I, what I didn't make clear is that Japan making these small cars said, you know what? We're going to sacrifice our margins. We're not looking to make a profit right away. These are small cars. They're fuel efficient. We want to make them also, what, price friendly. People look at these small cars, price elasticity. They ditch the gas guzzler and they move to the, the import, the Japanese import. So these Japanese companies were smart. They said, okay, we're not going to worry about our margins right now. We'll sacrifice that. But we want to focus on market share. Because what happens? Price elasticity, cheaper prices for the cars. Then people start moving toward the cheaper alternative. So you gain a, a, a swelling, a mass, a groundswell of these customers moving toward your product. So you create that market share. It expands, it expands, you, develop, you, you get a revenue stream going, and then you do what these companies did. They throw a luxury brand in there. Now you're competing on another level, that's what tier branding, and you might even be able to go into the other types of vehicles and the trucks and the SUVs and, and, and the whole nine. So Japan was, was, was very keen in terms of saying, okay, well, we're not going to worry about revenue. We're going to focus on market share. And because you can get market share and, of course, still lose money. There are a lot of companies where they have a lot of market share, but then their revenue streams and their margins are very thin. And so they, they, don't, um, they don't make it. And you may wonder a lot of times when you see these large companies going bankrupt, then you're just saying, how did that happen? How did they go bankrupt? They seem to be selling a lot of products. Well, they are, but the margins are thin. And the thin margins does not offset their expenses in terms of the overhead that they have for the buildings and the real estate and all the things that they have, the warehousing, uh, and then they end up you know, just not making it. 
that's the life of some of these retail outlets now that have closed their doors. And then the thing that you look at in the long run is return on investment. You, you're putting in uh, more technology. You're, you're doing more training with your employees. You're doing all these things. And then you expect that you're going to get a return on investment. You pay $10,000 for a piece of equipment and you're thinking, what is the when, when does that machine pay for itself? Because that machine is purchased because it does something and it increases efficiency and saves money. So you get to a point where those costs for that piece of equipment are basically absorbed by the revenue that you make from those uh, from that piece of machinery so let's go to some of the the other strategies uh, market skimming so what is skimming we know what skimming is that means you're skimming something off of the top but what it really means in actuality is that you have a new product you have an innovation that's going into the market for the first time and we know about innovations we know innovations, when they first come out, they're very, very expensive. And I actually found an article. I was kind of looking around, and I, I saw this article here about TVs. Nowadays, you can get a good flat-screen TV for very cheap, right? Some people have two, three, four uh, TVs in their house. And it's... um. You know, it's really affordable and they have 90 inch uh, flat screens. So you go to Best Buy and you go to some of these places and you see these TVs, um, very sleek looking and it's so crystal clear that it appears that you can even put your hand through and uh, and touch one of the one of the, the, the figures on the, in, on the program, on the TV program. They're so real. But this was an article that I found that I, I found th that it was uh, very interesting to me. And it is titled, Are TVs Really Cheaper Than Ever? We go back a few decades to see. And so they have the old school. That one was one of the first ones that came out, black and white. And so then you go back a few years and you see they break it down to price per square inch of the screen. And so here you have a, a TV, which was 55-inch manufactured retail price, $3,000, which is $2.32 per square inch. Now, this LG they have in the, in the heading here was uh, $1.78 per square inch. And so... It says in terms of screen area, they have um, the current TVs. Well, this is 2017, which are as low as $1,500, are $1.24 per square inch. So you're going for a 55-inch screen is now $1.24 per square inch. Let's see what they were like before, five years ago. So now you have $2.08. Five years ago for a 55 inch. In 2007, it was $6.60 for an equivalent 50 inch screen. 20 years ago, what was it? It doesn't say the screen size, but I'm assuming they're scaling it to the 50 inch. So here they're saying that in 1997, the equivalent of a 55-inch screen would be $30.45 per square inch. So that is for the Philips model. They actually have an ad for the Philips uh, flat screen in 98, which is um, very interesting. If you see the ad, it looks hideous. Uh, it looks like you need... Um, you probably need four, four or five people to carry that thing in a, a huge box. It takes up a whole wall. And here in 1954, 
This is when these TVs first came out, $110.20 per square inch. And that was all for the, of course, the people who had money back in those days could afford that, um, that TV. Uh, and it says here, this one was, this one was, um, this one was a uh, color. This was a color TV. Some of the earlier models were, uh, what was the price? Uh, 11000 $11,000 for this TV. Can you imagine that? Paying $11,000 for the earliest model. But again, it was an innovation. So that is, um, that is what you have when you have a premium product and you can skim the price looking for that um, that that market so if skimming is coming in high because it's a new product then coming in low is penetration pricing because you want to get into the market and you want to attract attention like I was talking about the case of Japan and the cars they use a penetration pricing method because they wanted to get in, but they were also opportunistic because they knew that because of the oil embargo, that gas prices would be higher. So they took advantage of that and they had a lower price point and they were able to attract a critical mass and, and find their way into the U.S. market. So it says here, char charging a low price in order to penetrate market quickly, appropriate to saturate market prior to imitation by competitors. That is actually what happened. If you remember the video that I did before, the Japanese came in with these small cars and then the American car companies responded with similar cars to fight off the competition. So it says appropriate to saturate market prior to imitation by competitors. Uh, and again, that's exactly what happened. But it says here packaged food Product makers with products that do not merit patents may use this strategy to get market saturation before competitors copy the product. So when you talk about food, okay, you, you're going, that's a low uh, entry barrier. You just have to go to the regulations and the certifications and then you're in. But if you're one of those, say, private store brands like a Publix or a Kroger or a Jewel and you make your own store brand, and it is essentially a knockoff of, say, a quality brand from Kellogg's or General Mills or a Procter & Gamble product. You're just making a knockoff. Uh, and, you know, obviously you have uh, some pricing mechanisms there where these knockoff brands are a little bit cheaper. And But if you have already have a market presence and strong branding, then you might be able to prove why it is um, it is acceptable to pay a little bit more for brand names as opposed to a store brand or a generic brand. Companion products, you all know about companion products. They like to use this uh, product of the razor and the blade. And you know, for uh, men, now women have their, their own razors and um, blade sets as well. But you now have um, you, you have all kinds of different uh, combinations of razors. You have the cheap ones that are disposable, and then you have the ones where you have the handle and you just buy the, the refill cartridge. And so essentially, you get into a situation where you can give away the handle and you make your money on the cartridges. What other type of examples can you think of? Uh, where this um, kind of pricing companion uh, pricing of companion products would uh, would would apply. Well, the razor and the blade is a very famous one, um, and they have that in the book. But there is one that they don't have in the book that I'm looking for. They spend a lot of time on the uh, when you talk about the obviously DVD players and other types of appliances that that's uh, of course very important also you think about cell phones cell phones are essentially a you can say it's a companion product 
because the cell phone, okay, it's a computer, but most people use the apps. So in some situations, a company, well, not Apple uh, or Samsung, but some companies may offer you a cheap phone because they don't want, they'll say that, okay, you don't have to sign a contract and you can use on as needed basis. You don't have to, uh, you know, buying it for, to run applications. Just if you're using text and making simple phone calls, then you get that kind of um, product. But essentially, cell phones, you're buying it for the, the, the applications. The one product that they don't mention and a product that uh, I like talking about is, and it'll make sense once I say it, if you think about printers, if you think about printers real closely, now your printer is, if you have one, maybe it's not so expensive. I have a color laser printer right here. And it was relatively, it wasn't too expensive. It wasn't too expensive. Um, as printers go, I mean, it's a pretty good printer. And again, it's color and I don't really use it as much as uh, I, I used it back in the day, or as I would have used it back in the day. But what do you notice about printers? And you all know where I'm going with this. A toner cartridge. Those things are crazy expensive. So you have a, uh, I have a LaserJet. This is a Color LaserJet Pro M477. So this is an office printer. Uh, HP is a good quality printer. And this particular printer has, it has uh, four cartridges that you have to buy. And all these these four colors, I can't remember the official names, but yeah, it's green, pink, yellow, and black. So that makes all the colors. But each of those cartridges are over a hundred bucks. You know, and then about this long, and they can slide in in their slots, and they last a certain number of copies. And then when the ink runs out; it gives you an indicator you're running low on this. You got to buy another one. It's another hundred bucks, and so depending on how much you print, you can continue to pay this uh, $100 uh, expense. And of course, and you go to re return, you, you get um, to recycle, that company is not paying for new cartridges. They're just refilling them with toner and they're basically just making their margins on that uh, toner cartridge. I mean, it's a perfect uh, example. You talk about companion products. So this idea of target costing, and you heard of these in principles of marketing, this idea of target costing, where you think of a price for a product that you want to make. And then you say, I'm going to make the best product that I can make at this price. So you're looking at a target. So it says here, used by Japanese companies to control costs, save on production expense, and create competitively priced global products, also called design the cost. So you set the price. This is how much it makes. This is how much it costs to make this product. And we're going to make the best one that we can with, within this price range. And so that is target costing. It is certainly a lot more efficient because you don't go over budget. Sometimes you say, I have this product and I'm going to make a product that the consumer wants. So then you, 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 you think about, OK, what kind of components they want? They want this quality component. They want this ingredient. They want this. And then you look at what goes into that. And you look at the price of what it takes to make that product and you're thinking okay how much do I have to charge in order to make this profitable now you have a you know a very high price point and so with target costing it basically keeps you disciplined because you know what you have to work with and then you say I'm going to make get the best components that money will buy within this price range 
and there you have one uh, approach. So in doing this, you have to determine the segments. You have to obviously do quite a bit of marketing research and look at what the customer is willing to pay. Uh, it says compute overall target costs with the aim of ensuring the company's future profitability. Allocate the cost targets to products, various functions. Again, you're staying within that range. Obey the cardinal rule. If the design team cannot meet the targets, the product should not be launched. If you're having to go over budget and say, oh, we need this other component, we have to increase the quality of this, then you just can't do it. You know, because now you're not you're not going at the target, you're going somewhere else. Export price ex escalation. Now this is this is a bit different because let's say you go into a market with a product and we're talking about exporting product is already made you're going overseas but of course depending on the market that you go in is going to determine the price also what else is included in this maybe the price levels in that country you might be able to charge a little bit more because this may be a new product. This is the product life cycle. Remember the product life cycle. You have four stages. You have the introduction, you have the growth, you have the maturity, and then you have the decline. So let's say that you're in America and the product life cycle is at the maturity stage or it's at the decline stage. And you're thinking that, okay, the end is near for this product. I'm reaching diminishing returns. I'm not making the profit I was making before. I have to find another market or I have to get out of the business. So then you start looking for other markets for your product. And then you, um, you, you choose a, a market where you're in the introduction and growth phase. So then you can have charge a premium product because it's rare. It's a new product, it's rare, and there is a bit of cachet if you have a new product and a product that nobody else uh, has. There's some kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of psychological importance that you get from having a brand new product. So here you have some other factors when you talk about price escalation. What are some of the other factors where well, you have a lot of fees attached uh, when you go over and you have to adjust the prices, not to mention all the freight charges that you see here, shipping charges, insurance and the VAT tax. So you have all of these uh, various costs that are part of your price escalation. And you see the CIF, the uh, cost insurance and freight. And so you have that added in. Then you have the VAT tax, value added tax, which is assessed. You have the distributor markup. You have the dealer markup. You have all of these different prices associated. And of course, at the end, this is going to um, result in price escalation. You have all of these questions pertaining to pricing factors. Does the price reflect the product's quality? It should. If you're going into another market, it should reflect the price's quality. Now, that is not always the case. That is not always the case. Uh, you have some situations where, where the products are overpriced. You have other situations where you have the price skimming. Where someone comes in with a product that's scarce, there's a big demand, and then people will pay that price for it. Many years ago, when I was doing my MBA, I ran across an article in the Wall Street Journal, and I still have the article filed away somewhere. But it, it was about this woman who took old shoes, and we're talking about athletic shoes, that people had tossed away, that, that had uh, thrown away. They had, they had tossed them. You know, they were run down and she gathered all these shoes up 
And I guess she found some intelligence over in Japan that there was a market. She went over to Japan and she, she sold used athletic shoes, Nikes. And people were paying a fortune. They were paying a couple hundred dollars for a pair of used shoes, for, for a pair of used Nikes. Why? Because they were new. They were new. Nobody had them. And there was a brand name. And so people bought these shoes. And she, she made a tremendous... Um, uh, profit uh, from doing that. But you have all of these other questions in terms of um, talks about elasticities and inelasticities. These are always going to be a factor when you go into a new market or foreign market. Uh, also, there are other factors not mentioned. It, how, how do foreigners feel about American imports? In some places, it's gold. It's like, yeah, I want that. That's an American product, right? That's an American brand name. I'll pay money for it because it's, they think it's quality that is associated with, with being made in America. Whereas in other places, they might have a different view. They might have a kind of cynicism or maybe skeptical of American products. Maybe it's political, but you have those things. You have your, your other uh, elasticities, price elasticities, inelasticities in terms of where the products are um, categorized. Is it an essential product? Is it non-essential? Is it something that is a just a straight luxury product? So that's going to determine the elasticities uh, of those uh, prices. Cost-based pricing. Now, of course, this is a, a little different model based on the analysis of internal and external costs. So you look at what you have available in terms of your supply chain and you build a product based upon what you have. Now, that may entail you um, building a product that might be a bit more uh, expensive and variable in terms of the cost. So it says here, firms use Western cost accounting principles to use the full absorption cost method. So here, per unit production costs are a sum of all past or current direct and indirect manufacturing overhead costs. Must include additional costs and expense when goods cross national borders. There's a typo there. I didn't notice that on the slide. So you're looking at a situation where you look at what, how your supply chain is set up, who your suppliers are, and what are the types of costs associated within the supply chain? Now that's different from target costing, but target costing you already set a you know a a range, and you have your margin that you're going to make, and you stay inside of that. This one may be variable uh, because it's in it's including all of those different costs that that are mentioned here, your per unit production costs. And those are variable depending on the market. Cost plus pricing. Rigid cost plus pricing means that companies set prices without regard to eight pricing considerations. So what are those? Eight? OK, so moving moving on, crossing international borders and we're approaching an hour. These are some of the costs I mentioned before. When you go overseas, there are all these incurred costs that you assume. So you're talking about export license, if you're exporting, currency permit, you have obviously your shipping, bill of lading, which is the paperwork for shipping, uh, customs papers, arrange for ocean freight, air freight, uh, cargo, refrigerated cargo if you need it, and you have to obtain insurance. So you have all of these different added costs you know, when you go overseas. And that is not to mention the if there are taxes, you know, other taxes um, that you have to pay. And I actually came across the harmonized tariff schedule if you want to look at this it's very interesting 
this came from the uh, US government site and it kind of gives you an idea of if you look at the far right you can see what the costs are for taxes for all of these things and these are all different kind of products So these look to be basically food products, but then they go. You go down, and they have all different kind of products, including this looks to be uh, these looks to be chemicals here. This is very thorough. It has all of these different uh, th this tariff schedule here. including uh, garments, car parts, machinery, watch straps, and then more chemicals, sparklers, socks, dairy products, sugars. So this is the uh, this is from the tariff database. So if you want to go to usitc.gov, then they have the tariff schedule. And if you're interested in exporting, then you can check and make sure that um, so that particular this schedule that I just showed you is interesting because I would think that these would be for tariffs of goods coming in this tariff schedule tariffs assessed on goods that are that are coming into the country So that spreadsheet that you saw was from the U.S. International Trade Commission. And it was called the Harmonized Tariff Schedule, or the HTS. You saw that in the last chapter. It might have been the chapter before that. We talk about importing and exporting. So it says here the HTS comprised of hierarchical structure for describing all goods in trade for duty, quota, and statistical purposes. This structure is based upon the International Harmonized Commodity Description and Coding System administered by the World Customs Organization in Brussels. The four and six digit HS categories are subdivided into eight digit unique US rate lines and 10 digit non-legal statistical reporting categories. So these are all for uh, tariffs assessed on goods coming into the United States. So they have these international commercial terms. And I won't go through all of these because it's quite a bit. You'll find those on page uh, 347. And I'll just show you what they have here in terms of the INCO terms, the in international commercial terms. Uh, these are the range. You've heard of some of these probably in your accounting classes. And it basically talks about who is responsible for the uh, shipment of goods from point A to point B. And so you have all these range of, of um, obligations by the buyer or the seller, depending on the contract. And so these are certainly uh, important to note. OK, again, inflationary environment. you got a situation where inflation is obviously obviously something to be noted looking at when you talk about the environment environmental influence of course uh, we can't forget about uh, inflation we can't forget about interest rates we can't forget about money supply all of these are very important factors uh, in in terms of uh, the price levels and of course, when you have government controls providing subsidies to local companies, it may put you at a bit of a disadvantage unless you get subsidies from your own government. So you're going in, 
your competitors are getting subsidies from the government. Subsidies can be a low interest rate. It can be a loan. It can be all kinds of, of assistance, technical assistance that they're providing you so that that foreign company can be in a better position to compete against you and you're the foreigner coming in. And then they're also dumping legislation so you can't come in and just undercut the, the market. Price ceilings and all of these other factors that are extremely important. Foreign governments may require funds to be non-interest bearing accounts for a long time. Restricts profits taken out of the country and limit funds paid for imported material. So I mentioned that before. That's called repatriation of capital. It kind of prohibits you from taking money out of your bank account and sending it back overseas. Uh, again, it creates price, price shocks. Uh, competitive behavior. Do you have a fair competitive environment? If competitors do not adjust their prices in response to rising costs, it is difficult to adjust your pricing to maintain operating margins. So you have a situation, inflation is raising prices because you have to continue to pay more to amp up your production. But let's say your competition doesn't raise their prices to offset the increase in capacity, then you can't do it because the market equilibrium. And so then you have to you have to eat the cost of the extra output that you're that that you are engaged in. So those are tricky situations. If competitors are manufacturing or sourcing in a lower cost country, it may be necessary to cut prices to stay competitive. So if you have a higher cost of production and the market is low, then you may have to find another way to make your product or source your materials differently or cut something so that you can go down on your price and not suffer um, too many losses as a result of the, you know, the difference between your price, the, the market price and the price that you pay to make the product. So as we head to the, the close of today, I am going to talk about the different alternatives you have. You have the ethnocentric extension or ethnocentric, which is the same as standardized pricing. You're going to have the same price in different locations, adaptation strategy, different price pricing strategy for different locations. And then you have a more globalized uh, geocentric pricing, neither fixes a single work price worldwide nor allows subsidiaries or local uh, distributors to make independent pricing decisions. Instead, the geocentric approach represents an inter intermediate course of action. Geocentric pricing is based on the realization that unique local market factors should be recognized when arriving at pricing decisions, these factors include local costs, income levels, competition, and local marketing strategy. So you have a kind of a uh, uh, kind of a variable strategy, as opposed to polycentric, where you know you're going to have a variable cost uh, strategy depending on the situation that you have on the ground. Gray market goods. This is uh, interesting. I heard a joke once. Uh, I was working for the Canadian consulate as a graduate student, and I was at a trade show uh, in Atlanta. I believe it was called Comdex. It was a big computer show. And I was working in uh, high-tech trade, and so we were trying to get people in the U.S., business people and companies, to do... Um, business in Canada and have technology partnerships and so one of the guys came up to the booth and he says yeah we're trying to get some 
I'm looking to get some gray market goods. And he was kind of nudging us. Like, I want to get some gray market goods. Now, obviously, we weren't selling anything. We were just there representing the country and as a uh, uh, a way of kind of attracting um, trade and business deals. And But it was just interesting that he kind of nudged us. And it's like, hey, I'm trying to get some gray market goods. I mean, it was a joke, but uh, gray market goods are interesting because one of the things that we, we found out before in one of the cases, the Walmart case, where they had the Cuban-made products, well, there is a way to get gray market goods. Now, it says the way it's defined here is trademarked products are exported from one country to another where they are sold by unauthorized persons or organizations. But I'll give you one, one example that's kind of close to home. I went to Cuba some years ago, and you know, Cuba is, they have, there's the embargo, and you're not supposed to have Cuban products in the United States. Wink, wink. So you have people that go, and you have friends that make orders and say, hey, bring back some Cuban cigars, bring back some rum, bring back this, bring back that. And you go over there and you just hope that they don't search your bag very closely and find any of the Cuban products because otherwise they might destroy your cigars, pour your rum out and and ask you a couple of questions uh, at the U.S. border. But what often happens is, is that you have situations where people want to get Cuban cigars and they may... Uh, they may go to Canada and get them, and they know the board borders are porous, and so they can get Cuban products that way. Now, of course, that is it is perfectly legal to buy Cuban products in Canada, but you have to get them across the border. That that is that is the uh, the trick. Now, what happened to me once is that I went to Jacksonville and I was at the Landing Mall, just walking around and. I was there meeting a friend, and um, I'm walking around looking at the the uh, shopping, the malls, and I see a cigar shop. So I walk in. I'm not a cigar smoker, and I was kind of looking around, thinking about Cuban cigars. And I asked the person. I said, "Do you have Cuban cigars?" And he kind of looked around and, like, a, in a whisper, like. Yes, we have them. We have Cuban cigars. Now, it's illegal. They're not supposed to have Cuban cigars. Those are gray market products. Uh, so the Cohiba cigar is the main cigar that people like to get because it's the luxury uh, brand. And you have a lot of fakes out there. But um, those trademark products were somehow exported. I don't know if they were exported directly into the United States or if somebody brought them over, if somebody got them through Canada or the Bahamas, because you can get products through the Bahamas. In fact, there was uh, when we were leaving uh, Havana, uh, Cuba, there was this uh, guy from the Bahamas that asked us where we were going. And we told him that we were going to the Bahamas. And he asked if anyone could... Um, take some cigars for him back to the Bahamas. He had already reached his limit of cigars that he can take uh, back home, back to Nassau where we were flying in. And I told him that I couldn't do that. I mean, I was full. You know, we had just come back from a week of, of Cuba and we had packed souvenirs and everything. And uh, he asked me if any of the other people I was with would, be willing to do that and uh, I said well you can ask but I knew what the answer would be I mean you're not going to take these goods from a stranger and uh, I mean you don't know what is in the packages that you're you're carrying I mean you have no idea it could be drugs or anything and so that that um 
example in Jacksonville of somebody getting Cohiba cigars and you know telling me they have them that that would be an example of gray market goods so that's totally unauthorized and here you have some of the the issues dilution of exclusivity which is probably another way to say um, brandy erosion you know somebody who's legitimately selling Cohiba cigars in that case they don't have the exclusivity and that kind of erodes the the brand and value dumping is just selling under market price which is you know illegal in a lot of places and governments protect their businesses from foreigners uh, doing that price fixing that is companies getting together and then controlling the um, competition uh, so to speak so it says the horizontal price fixing you're talking about people in the same markets whereas vertical you're talking about people in the supply chain all the way from procurement to manufacturing to distribution so you have that um, uh, which which is interesting because we talked about the Koretsu which is you know families of companies controlling the entire supply chain and making sure that you have a certain band of um, um, pro within uh, price uh, price levels so that you can be competitive on the market and then transfer pricing you find between subsidiaries and between branches in terms of price uh, prices being absorbed by other affiliates so finally you have a different you have counter trade you have a variety of ways of counter trading uh, which essentially deals with exchanges barter arrangements promises to fulfill an equal amount of trade in the future uh, offset trading which is a promise for a future uh, transaction um, buyback which is uh, a bit different because you're supplying a country with equipment and then you will for, for the exchange would be to import those products that are made by the equipment that you have supplied them and then switch trading is the, then offering an obligation that is owed to you to another party uh, without exchanging anything you're just offering them the the uh, obligation that another party has with you so that's going to do it for chapter 11 in pricing and we are scheduled to have a guest speaker on Thursday and hopefully you will have had a chance to watch this video prior to his um, coming to visit with us via Zoom. So make sure that um, you're looking on uh, in the book. And I know we're not having a um, we're not having an exam on chapters 11 through 14, but there are going to be quizzes. And so you want to make sure that you are prepared and not only for the quiz but just for your own edification and you need this material I mean you need to have this knowledge because if you're going out there you're going to be expected to know uh, this content so it's uh, good for your edification and you're paying for it uh, so you want to make sure you get your money's worth so that's all I have and uh, I will be um, communicating with you and uh, I will see you soon. Take care.